So good morning guys, um, first of all welcome to the 5th uh, Memes at Me lecture. Uh, my name is Irene Cuesta Redondo and today I'm going to be talking about uh, the axial skeleton and connections of the spine and the thorax. Uh, first of all, can you guys uh, hear me well? Can you see the presentation well? If someone can please uh, write it on the, um, on the uh, chat, that would be very helpful. So can you guys hear me or not? Hmm. Yes, I know. I think it's my computer that it's making the noise and I do not know how to fix it. Sorry. <laughs> I can talk a little bit lo louder if that's okay. Um, so you guys can understand me better. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so let's wait a little bit so people start connecting. Um, so uh, for for first year students, uh, I've heard guys you have the the first USME uh, test in two weeks. So this topic is going to be um, in there. Um, it's not a very complex topic, uh, you just have to, um, to be sure that you know the bones so that you understand the articulations, the joints, uh, but it's not a very complex topic uh, and I think it's also multiple choice, so if you know it, there are not, not going to be tricky questions uh, about this this topic. Um, they can be a little bit harder in muscles and that, but not, mm, not for this. So make sure you know it because it can give you can give you a good score. So um, let's start. So um, we're going to go through the bones and the joints. Um, the first part of the bones is going to be to talk about the vertebrae. First we're going to see a comparison of all of the vertebrae. And, and then we're going to go through each of them more in detail. Um, in the final exam, um, you can get a vertebrae and they can ask you which one it is and to explain uh, why you think it is that type of vertebrae. So it's important to know this kind of stuff. Also, we're going to talk about the uh, sacrum and the coccyx, uh, then the ribs and the sternum. Um, and then we're going to talk about the joints. Um, we're going to talk about the atlanto-occipital joint that it also involves the skull, but but uh, you haven't studied that yet. But it's important for 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 the vertebral column for fixation of all the whole body. So we're going to talk about it. Uh, also the atlanto-axial. Um, then about the whole intervertebral articulations and uh, intervertebral discs, how uh, we can do movement with our vertebral column, then the costa vertebral, the sternocostal, and the intervertebral. Uh, you'll understand more as we go more in detail. So let's start. Hope everyone is connected and let's start. So, um, vertebrae, common features for all vertebrae. So this table that you see here, um, Dr. Yuko uh, made it last year uh, during the lecture. I guess he also did it this time. And it is really helpful for uh, recognition and differentiation between vertebra. Um, so um, on the bottom here, I hope you guys can see my arrow. Uh, on the bottom, we have the three different, uh, uh, the three different vertebra. This is the first one on the left. It is the cervical, then thoracic, and then lumbar. So, um, the common features. What does every vertebra have? So, uh, we're going to have the body, which is going to go from the smallest to the uh, biggest. So, 
from the higher segment, the cervical, so from the smallest, medium, and large. You can clearly see it well. Um, also something that I didn't mention, uh, so there are uh, seven cervical vertebrae, there are 12 thoracic vertebrae, and five lumbar vertebrae. Um, then, uh, so here we saw the bodies, uh, now we go to the processes. So the processes is something that uh, you have to comment uh, for every vertebrae. They all have the three processes. So the most recognizable one is the spinous process. So uh, the spinous process here, here, and here. Um, um, so on the cervical vertebrae, it is short. It is bifurcated, which means it has like two two heads to go somehow two parts, and um, it is bifurcated from C two to C six, um, and C seven um, is the first one that is palpable. So uh, when you're touching um, the um, the vertebral column, oh, the skin <laughs> covering the vertebral column, uh, the first um, spinous process that you're going to touch. What are you going to feel? It's going to be C7. This is important for for um, measurements and for like um, injections and to calculate what you want to inject. Um, also here I mentioned carotid tubercle C6, uh, but we'll talk about uh, it a little bit later. Then the spinous process of the thoracic vertebrae. Um, it is longer and it is caudally facing. What does it mean? So you can see here on the whole vertebral column, you can see how um, they go down and they reach uh, the level of the lower vertebrae and the adjacent uh, lower vertebrae. So if this is my body and, and this finger is my spinous process, it is going to be lower like this and it is long. Um, and then um, the spinous process of the lumbar vertebrae, uh, it is shorter and it is at the same level of the body. You can see it here. It's it, That's called sagittal, sagittal, in the sagittal position. So you can see it here. Um, then we go to the transverse process. So the transverse process uh, is also helpful for recognition a little bit maybe more than the spinous process um, because um, for the cervical one it is very very uh, distinguishable because it has a hole on it that is called the um, transverse foramina um, transverse foramen um, and it has the anterior and the posterior tubercles we'll talk about this later too then uh, on the traffic uh, it is longer and it is going to have a um, facet, faucet uh, for the articulation with the ribs, with the, um, yeah, with the ribs. And then finally in the uh, lumbar one, um, it is longer, you can see it, and it is going to have the accessory process. Finally, the articular process. Um, the articular processes serve for the intervertebral articulations, so for connection of all the vertebra, of all the vertebrae, and um, we're going to have the superior and the inferior articular processes, um, which are going to be in different um, position or in different orientation uh, based on the segment. So in the cervical segment, you can see how they are in an oblique position, while in the traffic one, they are in a frontal position and in the lumbar one, they're in a sagittal position. So uh, sagittal position, it's the same one as the um, spinous process. And then some special features that uh, can help you for identifying, well, for example, uh, if you get uh, atlas or axis, which is C1 or C2, um, they're very easily recognizable, so you're not going to have problems with that. And then for recognizing of cervical ones, you can use that transverse for amen. So that hole that we talk about. Um, then um, on the traffic segment, um, we're going to find, um, they're a little bit visible here. Well, not really. <laughs> 
So uh, in, we have um, the articular faucets also, <coughs> pardon, the articular faucets or surfaces for the articulation with the head of the ribs. And then, sorry, um, and then in the number of ones, uh, we have the mammillary and the accessory processes, the mammillary and the accessory processes. So let's take a look at um, C1 and C2. So first of all, Atlas, uh, this is the first um, first cervical vertebrae. Um, what did I do to study the vertebrae? So yeah, I think if you follow this, it is very uh, fast to study. So first you try to think about all the common parts uh, that you can see in the vertebra that can be also seen in the rest of the vertebra and you mention them and then you talk about the processes. So if you, um, like I did here, if you follow this structure, uh, you are sure you're never going to forget anything because you have like this skin in your head and uh, by visualization of the image you have in your head also, um, you're, it's very difficult that you forget something, that's what I mean. So, common parts. We see this massive hole here. This is the vertebral foramen. Um, it serves for the passage or it is the um, spinal cord canal to cut it somehow. And when we uh, join more than one vertebra, we're going to have the intervertebral foramen. Um, Atlas um, does not have a body. You cannot, you can see that it does not have a body, but instead it has the anterior arch and the posterior arch. So, um, the anterior arch, it's going to have the anterior tubercle, which is like a permanent or a future construction of the body in the lower vertebrae, and the articular facet for dance. So, Dense is a structure of axis, which is C2, that it's going to help articulate um, the neck. So uh, we have atlas C1, and here we have the faucet, and then the dense is going to insert in here, so in the articular facet for the dense. And this will be the anterior, this will be the anterior arch with the facet in here, and it's going to articulate like this. I hope you guys can see it. <laughs> Um, and then the posterior arch, um, the posterior arch has the posterior tubercle and the groove for vertebral artery. Um, it is the only, um, the only vertebra that has the groove for the vertebral artery. Why? Because um, as you can see here, um, the transver transverse foramen that we'll talk about, um, from C6 to C1, Vertebral artery is going to extend through the vertebral foramen of the of the C six to C one. And then on C one, it is going to exit, and it is going to go through the or over the groove for vertebral artery, sulcus arteria vertebralis, and and it is going to um to enter the skull for for innervation of the cerebellum and cerebrum and etc. So. Now we go to the processes. So, spinous process, transverse process, and articular process. So, no spinous process. Instead, we have the posterior tubercle. Transverse process, it is short and it is, um, it is, um, it contains the transverse foramen and also what we can call the anterior tubercle and the posterior tubercle of the transverse, transverse foramen. In between these two tubercles, so here, there should be a group uh, or a representation of the group um, that it, it, it is made for the exit of the spinal nerve. Um, I think, yeah, so it's group for spinal nerve, so sulcus nervi spinalis. And then the last one is the articular process. So, the superior articular process, you can see how it is huge, it is very big because it is going to articulate with the, um, with the skull, with the uh, occipital condyles. Um, I don't have an image of the, of the um, occipital bone, 
but it's basically two masses on each side that are just gonna uh, articulate like a cushion with the uh, width at last. And um, then the inferior articular surface, which is going to serve for articulation with the axis. Um, yeah, that's it about uh, Atlas. Uh, so just follow this scheme and it's very, very easy. Then we have Axis. Axis is also very recognizable because of the structure of the dents. Um, so we go again uh, to vertebral foramen, in the vertebral foramen. Uh, then we have the body here. It is not very, uh, very large. And then when we have the body, we have two things that we have to mention. That are um, fascias anterior and posterior. So this is my body. And <laughs> this is my body and this is my spinous process. So uh, if this is, uh, this is very difficult to explain. So basically this is going to be fascias anterior, fascias posterior, so anterior surface and posterior surface. Uh, it's just for orientation and for for um, ligaments and that stuff that you need to know. Uh, then uh, this is going to be fascius terminalis superior that is absent here. In axis we don't have fascius terminalis uh, superior because we have bends, but we have fascius terminalis inferior. Um, we have bends, um, bends uh, serves for articulation with atlas, and we have the anterior articular faucet here, which is going to articulate with the anterior arch of atlas. Uh, so we go back, it's going to enter here, going to articulate here, and the posterior articular facet for the transverse ligament of C1 atlas. Then we have uh, what is called the pericle, <laughs> which basically joins the body and the uh, artic superior articular uh, process um, and the articular process and then the arch that joins the articular process and the spinous process. So again, this is the pericle and this is the arch. Uh, processes of axis. Um, spinous process as well as the rest of the, um, of the cervical vertebrae. It is short and bifurcated. Um, transverse process, it contains transverse foramen, anterior and posterior tubercles that we mentioned. So, uh, anterior and posterior tubercles, group 4, um, group 4 exit of spinal nerve. And then the articular processes, we're going to have the superior articular, superior articular faucet or process for um, atlas and the inferior articular process for articulation with C3, with uh, third cervical vertebra. Um, yeah, you can see that it's always the same, just follow scheme. So now we go, we have to talk about the cervical vertebrae in general the thoracic vertebrae in general and the lumbar vertebrae in general. So, cervical vertebrae, body, small body compared to the rest, uh, vertebral foramen and intervertebral foramen. Um, so, sorry again, body, it has the uh, fascius anterior, fascius posterior, so this will be fascius anterior and this will be fascius posterior of the body. Um, this is superior, uh, fascius terminalis superior or um, superior, uh, superior uh, terminal surface and on the other view we have uh, fascius terminalis inferior. We start having here the um, usnate process uh, or uncal process I've heard too. So it serves for the articulation between the bodies of the vertebrae. Uh, we're, we're going to have located between the vertebral bodies, we're going to have the intervertebral discs. So, um, so these two structures, these two uncle um, processes or osmate processes on each side are going to help me for this, um, for this vertebral disc connection. And then again we have the pericle, which is uh, body to 
articular process and uh, the arch which is which is um, articular process to spinous process three spin three processes sorry spinous process spinous process short and bifurcated um, transverse process um, short um, Short with the transverse foramen, anterior and posterior um, tubercles, uh, good for the spinal nerve. You can see it here better. Um, and then the articular process, so basically superior and inferior articular processes and facets. So we move to the thoracic vertebrae, again, vertebral foramen and intervertebral foramen. Uh, the body, uh, as is, um, Fascias anterior and post posterior and posterior, um, superior eh, terminal, fascias terminalis superior and fascias terminalis inferior. Um, where else the uncal processes again? And uh, here now in the traffic vertebrae, we start finding the superior and inferior costal facets. So um, you have to know that the um, um, that the ribs uh, articulate with the thoracic vertebrae, so um, so that's why we have the superior and inferior costal facets. Costal means rib, um, so they're in the body. We have the superior and the inferior. We'll talk more about this when we see the articulation. Um, then we have the pedicle, body to articular process, and the arch, articular process, spinous process. Um, eh, then the processes, spinous process, it's longer and it is caudally facing. Transverse process, it is long and it has the transverse costal facet, also for articulation with, um, with the ribs. And then for the costal transversal articulation that we will talk about later. Then the articular process um, here, superior and inferior articular processes. They are in the frontal position. So if we remember um, cervical, we're in the oblique position. These are frontal, and then the lumbar are going to be sagittal. Um, Okay, and we go to lumbar, largest body, vertebral foramen, intervertebral foramen, uh, fascias anterior and posterior, fascias terminal and superior and inferior, uh, uncal processes, or yeah, and then the pericle and the arch processes. Uh, spinous processes is mm, shorter and it is in the sagittal position. Transverse process, it is long compared to the vest, compared to the cervical mainly, and it has the accessory process. Um, and the um, um, articular processes have the, um, have the faucets in the sagittal position, and they have the mammillary process here, you can see. So, AM, AM. Just follow always the same, mm, the same, the same procedure, and you remember. So, for example, for me, this technique was just like the transverse process needs an A, and the articular process does not need an A. I don't know if, I, if you understand me, but it's basically that um, articular cannot go with accessory because I cannot have two A's together. So I need an A in all of them. That's my my technique to remember which one has one, which one has which. So now we move to sacrum and coccyx, uh, which are basically fused vertebrae. Fused vertebrae. Um, very easy to recognize if you get it in the exam. Um, so uh, sacrum. Uh, we're gonna have the base. And the apex, so base is always the larger one. Uh, apex is the smaller one. Um, we have fascia terminalis superior. It's another vertebra, so it's just going to have the same as the rest of the vertebra. Um, 
fascias terminalis superior, fascias terminalis inferior. Um, you can see how the function of this vertebrae left the transverse, what we call the transverse uh, ridges. Um, what else? So, this is going to be, this image shows the pelvic surface, which is going to have this shape, while the, um, while the um, dorsal surface, so the one on the back, uh, dorsal means posterior, it's going to have this shape. So, I don't know, I think this is concave and this is convex, but I have problems with those two ones. So, yeah, just check it if it's right, because I, I'm not sure. Um, so, what can we see in the pelvic surface? So, as we mentioned, those uh, transverse ridges, we're going to have the promontorium here, which is, uh, which is, in which place, so when we talk about the shape of the vertebral column, you'll see that. And then we have the transverse, for, um, sorry, the sacral foramina. We call this the pelvic sacral foramina and this the dorsal sacral foramina, but they're exactly the same. Just from one side to the other, the view changes. And we go to the dorsal surface. So the dorsal surface, um, the dorsal sacral foramina, then the medial, intermediate, and lateral sacral crest, which are, if you get the bone, you can really palpate them and you can very well see them. Um, and this is the medial, intermediate, right to the side, and then after, or more lateral to the um, uh, foramina, we're going to have the lateral crest. Um, then we have the sacral hiatus. Uh, which hiatus means opening, so it's the opening of the sacral canal. So this whole thing, so from here to here, that is the sacral canal. Oh, you have it here. So this is the sacral canal, which serves for uh, for it contains the spinal cord, not exactly the spinal cord at this level, but some um, spinal fluid and, and other structures that you'll see when you study nervous system. Um, yes, what are some important features that people tend to forget? So, the sacral cornu and the superior articular processes. They are exactly the same. So, uh, exactly the same as in the rest of the vertebra, that's what I mean. So, the superior articular processes for articulation with, um, with L5, uh, lum fifth lumbar vertebra and the sacral cornu are remnants of the, um, the sacral cornua are remnants uh, of the um, of the inferior articular processes so just imagine it being a whole vertebra um, you would have the superior and the inferior but instead of articular processes they are called cornua um, yes, and something important that you will see again um, when you study. Well, you did already study the articulations of the of the leg, I think. But basically, we have the articular surface for the um, for the sacroiliac joint, and yeah, that's everything. And then the coccyx, very easy, very fast. Um, base and apex, um, it only has fascia terminalis superior, which serves for articulation with the sacrococcygeal joint, um, sacrococcygeal syncondrosis, sorry, and it has the transverse process, you can see it here, the transverse process. Just think that they are also, um, they're also um, vertebra, so they're going to have the same features to call it somehow. So now we move to the ribs. Um, you can get a rib and maybe they ask you uh, how to identify this rib or what type of rib you think you are, they, um, you have. Uh, so you know there are top ribs um, out of which 
uh, one to seven reap we call through reaps and this is because they are attached to them or they have the connection with them with the sternum and then the from eighth to twelfth they're called uh, false reaps and the last ones are also called um, eleven and twelve they're also called flotating floating floating or flotating <laughs> floating reaps I think. <laughs> Uh, one of the two <laughs> floating reefs. Um, so what is the general structure of a reef? Um, so we're going to have three parts of it, the head, the neck, and the body. So the head, it's going to have the superior and the inferior articular facets uh, for articulation with the head of the reefs, uh, or with the um, body of the vertebrae, sorry. So, just imagine it, we have the superior and the inferior, we go back to the, so superior and inferior, this is for articulation with the vertebrae, with the ribs. Um, then we have the neck, where we have the, um, the costal tubercle, um, that it also, um, it also creates an articulation, a reinforcement articulation with the with the um, vertebrae. Then we have the body or shaft. Uh, we're we're, we're going to have the costal angle, which is when we move uh, from the back part of our body to the lateral and to the front, and then the costal groove. So the costal groove. Uh, it's important because it serves for the location of the um, of the um, intercostal vessels and nerves. So this is the order of what you what you're gonna find in the costal groove. So so purely you're gonna have intercostal vein in the middle, intercostal artery, and lower intercostal nerve. Uh, the mnemonic we use is ban, like the car the band. Um, you can see it in this image, vein artery nerve. Be careful, do not confuse with the collateral branches, which follow just the opposite. So it's it's nerve, artery, and vein. Um, but they're not located in the, um, in the costal groove, so, so they're just like different, different vessels, the collateral branches. And then finally, we're going to have the uh, costal cartilage that serves for articulation with the sternum that we'll talk about it later. And then something important about the first rib is that we're going to have the subclavian um, vein groove and the subclavian artery groove. So groove or sulcus, um, it's important to know this because when you have to study the the um, the course of the of the vessels uh, you're gonna have to say so it, it passes through the subclavian groove uh, subclavian vein groove on the first rib so for also for orientation it is helpful so you have here the um, the vein and the artery grooves so then we go to the sternum very easy um, we have three parts, manubrium, body, and sheepoid process. Um, manubrium and body are, are joined or there is located between them what we call the external angle uh, or angle of lace too. Just, you have to mention it. And then we go through the notches. So we have three types of notches. Um, notches in Latin, when you hear it like this, it's called um, incisura. So, um, uvular notch for uvular vessels, um, clavicular notch for articulation with the clavicle, um, and then the costal notches for articulation with the, um, uh, with the ribs, with the coste. Uh, there, are, um, there are seven costal notches, which is important for us here, uh, for articulation with um, seven, seven true ribs. That's why they're called through, because, because they, they attach to the, to the sternum. 
So that's it about the bones. Um, these bones are not very hard, so just just try to remember as many keywords that you can. Very very hard. Just make a um, general scheme for them, and then you're good on it. And the rest, uh, the the rib is not difficult, and uh, and the sternum has nothing, so so they're easy. So now we go to the joints. Uh, the joints are, are a little bit more complex, mainly because they have a lot of uh, of uh, ligaments. So you have to know the ligaments that are that are in the vertebral column, which there are a lot of them. But <laughs> don't be scared. So uh, we're gonna start with the atlanto occipital joint, which um. So just if you think about it, it is very easy to know what what the articulation does. Atlanto means atlas, occipital means occipital bone. So it's gonna join the occipital. Um, so wait, just one second. So um, on the general general on the first means lecture, um, they talked about how to describe an articulation. So you have to take, you have to say what bones are there, which with, which with are, um, with which articular surfaces. Then if they have a capsule, some ligaments, some membranes, the type of joint and the movements it can um, do, right? So uh, we're gonna follow this scheme because it's the best way for 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 the whole two. So articular surfaces. The occipital condyles and the superior articular faucet of or surface of atlas. Sorry, um, there is gonna have uh, it is going to have a capsule which is going to be attached to the margins of the articular surfaces. This is uh, the usual thing in most of the of the um, of the articulations in most of the joints. The capsule is not gonna be big. It's just gonna be around. Uh, the, um, the articular surfaces, except for example, like I don't know, like in the um, patella uh, or in the um, shoulder, the elbow, it might be a little bit larger um, for because it requires more and more lubrication, but not not in here, not in most of them that we're going to see today. So um, the capsule, uh, then some additional features. So. We have the anterior and the posterior atlanto occipital membranes. So they're just uh, the membranes that are going to go from the arches, so the anterior and the posterior arches, and they're going to insert in the um, around the occipital condyles. So anterior to occipital condyles and posterior to occipital condyles. Um, this um, mainly the posterior atlanto occipital membrane. Is important because it is going to be pierced by the um, by the vertebral artery. So you can see here how the vertebral artery is ascending. It is passing through the uh, groove uh, for vertebral artery, surcos arteria vertebralis, and it is piercing the posterior lant occipital membrane to go through from the magnum to the brain. Um, and anterior so on the anterior view obviously here anterior view and then we have the tectorial membrane which cannot be seen here but we will talk about it um, what type of joint it is it is an ellipsoid joint and it um, it has a little bit of uh, restricted movements it helps for flexion and extension of the neck and minimal lateral flexion like there's not that much movement, but the movement is done more with the lower vertebrae rather than with, um, with the atlanto occipital joint. Um, and medial and lateral atlanto axial joints. Why are there two joints in here? So we have the same one as in the rest of the vertebrae, and we have the special one, which is the medial one, that is done with the dense axis. So um, the medial one, the articular surfaces are the dense axis, and the articular facet or faucet 
uh, for vents on the posterior surface of the anterior arch of atlas, um, the one that we saw that I talked about a couple of times. Then the lateral ones um, are going to be the um, same ones as in the rest of the vertebrae, the inferior, so the inferior articular surface of the higher vertebrae, it's going to articulate with the superior uh, articular surfaces of the inferior vertebrae, like this. So um, that's just how it works at all the levels. Uh, articular capsule, it's going to be attached uh, on the margins of the articular surfaces. There are three capsules here, the one on the right, the one on the left, and the one on the medial, uh, medial uh, joint. Um, additional features, what ligaments can we see here? What membranes can we see here? So we're, we're going to have the anterior and posterior atlanto-occipital membranes, as we had in the, in the previous one. We're going to have the atlantoaxial ligaments, um, atlantoaxial ligaments, uh, we're going to have here. So, it's going to join the, um, the um, body of the, of the axis to the atlas, diagonally. And then we have the ilar ligament, uh, you can see it here. It goes, the ilar ligament goes from the apex of the dense. It goes from the apex of the dense to the lateral parts of foramen magnum. Foramen magnum is the hole, the massive hole on the opening, the massive opening on this skull, to call it somehow. Um, and then the final one is going to be the cruciform ligament. Cruciforms means cross shaped. So, you can very well see it here that it is composed of three ligaments. So it's the superior, not, not ligaments, sorry, like more like bands or parts. And the superior longitudinal ligament, uh, the superior longitudinal band, um, the inferior longitudinal band, which are both of them start from the transverse ligament of atlas. Uh, that is going to join both lateral masses of the atlas. And then it joins um, the the um, occipital bone, uh, the superior one joins the, oops, joins the occipital bone and the inferior one joins the body. The type of joint, it is a compost joint because we have the three joints uh, and then movement, it allows rotation with a range of 60 degrees. So it's not like we can do 360 rotation, right? It's only minimal rotation, uh, not even 90 degrees. Um, Intervertebral joints. If you understood the lateral atlantoaxial joint, you have the you have all of this. So um, again, the articular surfaces are going to be the inferior articular surface of the superior vertebrae and the superior articular surface of the inferior vertebrae. Oh, vertebra, sorry. And this is where we talk about the articular processes that they have different. Uh, different um, orientation, different orientation. So the cervical ones were op uh, were oblique, um, the traffic ones are frontal, and the number ones are sagittal. Um, but this it's it doesn't change anything uh, while doing the 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 intervertebral joints. And they have the capsule that is attached to the margins of the articular surface. And it is called uh, uh, the type of joint is plana, a uh, plain joint. Um, to to surfaces joining without any tuberosities or anything. Then the sarcococcygia synchondrosis. So if you don't know how to differentiate between synchondrosis, synarthrosis, and diarthrosis, and all those terms, check the first main lectures because the first means lecture, sorry, because um, all the terms are explained there and you need to understand these terms. Uh, because even if you get intervertebral joints, they might ask you, why do you think it is this type of joint and, and everything. So the general explanation about the joints is important. Um, Sacrococcygia synchondrosis. So 
Uh, articular surface is, is fascius terminalis inferior of sacrum. So, fascius terminalis inferior of sacrum and fascius terminalis superior of coccyx. Um, and we're going to have three ligaments here. We're going to have the anterior, this is the posterior, sorry, uh, posterior, anterior on the overview, and the lateral uh, sacrococcygeal ligaments, which is help, um, help um, to keep the coccyx in its position, and they also serve for the opening of the birth canal for women uh, during labor, and they're important for that because the coccyx, um, so if this is if this is the common position of the coccyx, uh, where the tip is into the birth canal, uh, when we're giving birth, when labor, it is going to go back things to the ligaments. Uh, so just for some tip for remembering that there has to be uh, some ligaments. Then this is another question uh, from the final. Uh, very easy question. So this is the long and the short ligaments of the vertebral column. So the short ligaments are the ones that are just going to be between vertebrae. Uh, so that means from one to one, stop. From one to one, stop. And and the long ligaments are the ones that are going to go through the whole through the whole vertebral column without uh, stopping. <laughs> to explain it somehow without. Without um, yeah, without borders <laughs> like the short ligaments too. So the short ligaments in in yellow, you can see them. Uh, we have ligamentum flavum or ligamenta flava in plural, uh, which join the vertebral arches. So um, basically, this uh, joins the vertebral arches. Then intertransverse ligament. So intertransverse transverse processes, interspinous, spinous processes. Um, so the intertransverse ligament um, here, it's going to join the um, uh, transverse processes of the vertebral column. Um, and the interspinous process, uh, interspin <laughs> interspinous ligament, it's going to join the spinous processes. Is this one, right? Do not confuse with this one. Okay, it's this one. Um, then the long ligaments, we have, let's start with the last one, the supraspinous ligament is this one. That joins the apex of the, of the um, spinous processes. Um, at the superior part of the vertebral column, it ends. So just imagine that you have your back. So it ends as the nuchal, nuchal um ligament or yeah the local membrane um, which is important for some um, trapezium origins I think and yeah um, so um, that's the supraspinous ligament here joins the apex and then we have the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament do not confuse anterior longitudinal ligament with anterior allantoccipital membrane. They are different structures. So, the anterior longitudinal ligament, it is going to join the articular, oh, sorry, the anterior surfaces of the vertebral uh, column, vertebral bodies. So, remember how I said there were uh, the fascius anterior and fascius posterior? So, if this is my vertebral column here, I'm going to have the anterior longitudinal ligament. Here, I'm going to have the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament. Here, I'm going to have um, vertebral foramen. So, yes, basically here you can see the posterior one, posterior longitudinal ligament and anterior longitudinal ligament. Intervertebral discs, very easy. Uh, they're located between the vertebrae. Um, they join, uh, they're in contact, or they're located between fascius terminalis inferior of the superior vertebrae and fascius terminalis inferior of the uh, fascius terminalis superior of the inferior vertebra. Um, parts of 
test the of the intervertebral discs. You just have to know that it has the nucleus pulposus and the annulus fibrosus. So um, nucleus in the center and annulus, which means ring, ring. <laughs> it is around the nucleus. Um, um, how many discs? There are 23 discs. Um, these 23 discs represent one fourth of the total length of the vertebral column. So that is, um, sorry, so that is that uh, three fourths are osseous. They represent the osseous um, part of the vertebral column, and one fourth it is the intervertebral discs. Uh, the first one, the first one where we can start counting the 23, it is going to be located between C2 and C3. Like this is the first place where we're going to have both fascis terminalis inferior and fascis terminalis um, superior of different vertebrae. Because remember, axis has dense on the superior part, so it doesn't have fascis terminalis superior. Uh, the last one is between the sacrum and uh, L5 because then we have the fused vertebra of the sacrum. So it's the last place where we can find the intervertebral discs. Very easy and it's a whole question of your order, so it's very nice. Shape and movements of the vertebral column. So um, I think it might not be seeing the tip here, but it's okay. So the shape of the vertebral column we can name uh, two lower doses and two key poses. So lower doses are the ones that are um, inverted C-shaped, so like D-shaped but without the D. So um, we're going to have the theoretical lower doses and we're going to have the lumbar lower doses. Um, so the cervical lower doses is produced by nuchal muscles. Uh, it, it happens when the baby starts lifting his head. Uh, so when the baby is uh, down in the down position and they start raising the head, the I think it's called tracking of the of the nuchal muscles uh, or the um, the contraction of the nuchal muscles produces this this uh, shape. And the same in the lumbar part, but with, um, with, um, sorry, I actually, the C and the D are inverted, sorry about that. Um, and the lumbar lower doses, of course, when the baby starts to walk about one year old and is produced by the dorsal muscles. Then the last one is the two kyphosis, the traffic and the sacral kyphosis. So the traffic one, um, it comprises the whole uh, traffic vertebrae and the sacral one here is the only one that is not smooth. So all these transitions are smooth unless there is some pathological reason uh, but this one is not smooth. The transition between the lumbar nervosis and the sacral kyphosis is not smooth because of the presence of the promontorium. Uh, um, yeah, because of the presence of the promontorium. Um, what movements, well, sorry, something first, some, uh, some important things is that we have the dextro uh, dextroesclerosis and sinistroesclerosis, which are caused, um, or, um, our vertebral column may be a little bit shift to the right or to the left depending on which one is our dominant hand. So if your dominant hand is the right one, uh, you, you will have dextroesclerosis. And if your dominant hand or right in hand is the left, you have sinistroesclerosis. Dexter and sinister is left, sorry, right and left in, in Latin. Um, and then other pathologies of the shape of the vertebral column that you study later, like, like scoliosis or very pronunciated and aggressive uh, um, lateral movement of the of the of the vertebral column movements of the vertebral column so it allows a lot of movements uh, it allows the dorsiflexion and the anteflexion 
which is basically like when you try to touch your uh, your feet and when you try the other way around. Um, lateral reflection to the sides, rotation, rotation is limited uh, because of the presence of the ribs. Um, and then springy movements. So springy movements, it's like, I don't want to do this movement. <laughs> so it's like your vertebra being like this, right? Like when you're jumping to call it somehow, and then mobility, mobility depends on the parts of the vertebral column. So the cervical part is the most mobile, and it's the one that is going to do also rotation for the neck. And then the thoracic part, it's the less mobile part because of the presence of the ribs. So we can, uh, we can rotate less because of the ribs. And then the lumbar part is, is it has restrictive rotation due to the sagittal position of the articular surfaces. Because if it's frontal, you can move them like this, just you can move them quite easily. But if it's sagittal, they're gonna bump into each other. Um, now we go to the costovertebral joints. Uh, the costovertebral joints um, are a little bit they're not difficult, but you can mix the terms a little bit. So there are two costovertebral joints. So, oops. So let's talk about the first one. The first one is the articulation of the head of the ribs. So we can see a rib here, and this is the head of the vertebra, with the superior and the inferior articular uh, faucets for the head of the ribs. So. Um, articular surfaces, this two, and the two ones in the, um, and the ones in the head of the ribs. Um, articular capsule is going to be attached uh, to the margins of the articular surface. Additional features, we're going to have the radiate ligament, is this one, which basic function is to protect the articulation, to uh, reinforce the capsule. Um, most of the ligaments that do not have to do with movement, they reinforce the, the, the capsule. Uh, and the intraarticular ligament, which is this one, which is intraarticular means it's located inside the articulation. So just imagine that, you know, it will be like dividing the, the, the capsule, the articular capsule. So something important that I mentioned here is that you tend to think, or I did unless, I tend to think that superior goes with superior and inferior goes with inferior. It's not like that. Superior goes with inferior. So this is my T1 and this is my T2. And this is my first rib. So the inferior, uh, the inferior articular faucet for the head of the rib is going to join the superior articular um, surface of the rib. And uh, on T2, the superior articular uh, faucet for the head of the ribs is going to join the inferior one. So inferior with superior and superior with inferior. Um, as you can see here, right? Um, so each um, each um, rib is going to connect with the with um, with two vertebrae, two vertebrae to call it somehow. And uh, the type of joint it is a plane joint, and the movement it is limited to the axis of movement of the ribs. So that means the ribs cannot move uh, that much. Uh, so like. Rotation is limited, um, lateral flexion is limited, basically, yeah. And then the second one here, it's going to be the costa transverse articulation. So, costa transverse articulation, it is, uh, I think the best image is here. This is a superior view. So, this will be the articulation with the heads of the ribs. And this will be the articulation with the uh, costotransverse transverse articulation. 
So this is going to be the articulation between the articular facet on the costal tubercle, so on the rib tubercle here, and the articular surface on the thoracic transverse process. So remember how we mentioned that a special, special feature of the traffic transverse process was that it has the articular surface for the costal transversal articulation. Um, the capsule is going to be attached to the margins of the articular surfaces and there are some additional features. So uh, the lateral and the superior costal transverse ligament. So uh, costal transverse ligament the lateral one is the one that it's going to unite uh, or join the um, the transverse process of the same level vertebrae with the costal uh, tubercle of the rib, so uh, same level. And then the superior costal transverse ligament, it is going to join, as you probably have explained with this one, so rib, same level, transverse process, is the lateral costal transverse ligament. If the ligament goes up, that is called the superior costal transverse ligament, and it's going to join the transverse process of the superior adjacent rib with the costal tubercle of the of the rib we're talking about. So superior and lateral. And then we also have to mention the lumbocostal ligament that you can see here which is going to join the, um, the transverse process of the L1 with the uh, 12 rib. Um, and it's important for some things, but not important right now. Type of joint plane movement, same, limited by the axis of movement of the ribs. Um, okay. And um, we're getting to the end, so if you guys have any questions, please just feel free to write them on the chat. I'll keep talking in the ways. So, uh, external articula sternocostal articulations. Um, so, first, why does it say sternocostal connections? Because there are two types of connections uh, when we're connecting the ribs and the sternum. So, the first to the fifth rib. They're called sternocostal articulations or joints. And then um, the last two and the first one, sorry, it was second to fifth. And then the first one and the last two, they are the, um, they are the sternocostal synchondrosis. So uh, remember we have the one to seven costal notches. Um, so that's going to be part of my articular surface and the costal cartilage. So, costal cartilage is going to insert in the uh, costal notch uh, of the sternum. Uh, capsule is going to be attached to the margins of the articular surface. Additional features. Very easily recognizable, the anterior and the posterior radiate ligaments. Here you can see the anterior, which at the end it is going to form, like when you have all of them, it is going to form the anterior and um, posterior sternocostal membranes, which are going to partially cover or completely cover the, the sternum. And um, yeah, so here, these are the radiative comments, and this is the anterior radiative comment and the anterior uh, sterno, sternocostal membrane. And then the intra, uh, sorry, interarticular sternocostal ligament, this one, intraarticular, sorry, is wrong here intra-articular sternocostal ligament which serves for the union of, um, of uh, manubrium and body uh, available of the second rib. That is the one that you can see how it attaches both on the manubrium and the, and the body. Uh, sternocostal synchondrosis for first, six and seven. Um, it is a cartilaginous union. Uh, it is not the same type of union uh, as in the in the rest of the of the um, of the ribs, but that's that's just yeah, just so you know it. Like you have to explain it, but uh, it, that's enough. Um, and we also have the same comments here. You can see how it it also forms part of the membrane. So um, just that there are different types of connections internally. 
the intercostal articulations and movements of the thorax. So intercostal um, articulations, um, they connect the ribs. Um, so they connect the costal cartilage, that's why they call intercondral. Condral is cartilage, means cart cartilage. Uh, costal cartilage is from fifth to nine ribs. Um, and basically what you have to explain here, but this is more like a topographical question um, about the membranes and about how you have the mastrous and everything. Uh, there's going to be the internal intercostal membrane that is going to join the osseous part of the, of the vertebrae. So it's going to join the whole uh, osseous part, but then uh, at the level of the um, of the cartilaginous part, we're going to have the external um, the external intercostal membrane. So um, osseous part, internal intercostal membrane, cartilaginous part, uh, external intercostal membrane. Um, the orientation is also different, but I don't want to. Sweet and low, yes, we did. Uh, movements of the thorax. Um, the movement is limited by uh, individual position and individual uh, orientation of the ribs. Um, so there are two basic movements that are important also when we talk about the muscles um, for, um, for respiration, uh, so inspiration and expiration. Um, so when we do inspiration, the ribs rise. Um, that's, that means that the transverse and the sagittal diameters are going to increase, uh, leaving space for growing of the, of the um, lungs. And then when we do expiration to help the, eye, the air uh, to go out of our body, the ribs go down, decline, and the, um, and the transverse and sagittal diameters decrease. Um, so this is important participation in the in the ribs, uh, in the in the respiration. So um, that's basically everything that I had. Um, it's not a difficult topic. Uh, just uh, try to make your own your own techniques for studying it, but not hard at all. I recommend you uh, go again through the through the um, um, table with the vertebrae, uh, vertebrae recognition, um, because it can be important if you have to go to the final. Uh, then um, the ribs articulation um, with the um, with the head and the costal transversal articulations. With, um, with the vertebral bodies, that is also important. Um, and yeah, that's it. So, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Feel free to go again through this lecture, get any notes that you need. Um, you can also find me on Facebook and ask me if you have any questions about what I explain or uh, you want me to share some of my notes or things that I, that I use for studying, please feel free to contact me. So, I guess that's it. <laughs> no questions? <laughs> well guys, so stay healthy and study and I hope you pass your your anatomy exam. Thank you very much.